I feel um, God wanted me to sing this particular song. And so um, I put together some verses that I was impressed to put together to read. And um, Jesus said, Take heed that no one deceives you. Narrow is the gate and straight is the way, and there be few who will go there. For the Lord himself shall descend with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the arrows of lawless men and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I have fixed my mind on another time, on another time. And here I mean to stand on till God gives me more light. And that Today, today, until he comes, I have fixed my mind on another time, on another time. I have set my course on the narrow way, on the narrow way. For I know the time is close at hand for which I watch and pray. And that is today, today, today. Son of man, oh. 
This is my fervent prayer For I've caught a glimpse of glory And I'm longing to be there For I've caught a glimpse of glory And I'm longing to be there I have fixed my mind on another On Well, again, we have been blessed by our musicians and our praise team. And we are blessed by Sister Janibel's special music this Sabbath morning. Amen. God has been good to us thus far again. And so we are grateful to him for his constant goodness to us. We... have invited our various guests to our um, next Sabbath's program. So we just want everyone to be reminded of the need, if you have not done so yet, to invite someone to be here with us next Sabbath for our service, for our community guest day service. Uh, we want to welcome back Sister, our our sister who was on our trip to, uh, to Guyana, and we prayed for God's blessings upon her, and we pray that God will continue to bless the work that they did them there. We appreciate hearing from um, Sister Pancho of the work that they did them there, and we, we regret the loss of a partner who joined with them to uh, do missionary work down there. I like to say, and I'm, I heard someone who I think was wise saying it, and, and that was that when you do good service to people, you are doing the work of God. And so it is that um, confidence in knowing that we're doing God's work that encourages us as we, as we go from day to day, bearing the burden in the heat of the day. So... So we want to pray for God's blessings and, and help to the family who have experienced that loss. And, and so we're here today uh, to reflect a little bit more on God's word. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, if you turn with me there. Luke chapter 13. I'm going to read from verse 1. I'm not going to read the entire thing. I'm just going to read the introductory part to this parable there. They were present at the season. Some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the sacrifices, with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were 
sinners, more sinners, worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Dear God of heaven, we give you thanks for your goodness to us and for bringing us to church the Sabbath day. We thank you for the praise and the prayers and the study, these things which already happened here today. And I give you thanks again for bringing our traveling saints back to church as they were involved in various services in other countries. We give you thanks and I ask your special blessings on their labors. I lift before you especially the person who lost his life there in Grenada this week who had committed to doing service for the people. And I ask your blessings upon his family and I ask for health and healing to them and special knowledge that they may have of the great and blessed hope in Jesus Christ. And for the sick amongst us, I hold them also. And at this time, as we open your word, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Jesus did an interesting thing. It does that every week. And if one of our deacons can be so kind as to turn on this air conditioner, I'll appreciate it. Both of these are off. It does that every week. And I'm here burning up and I forget to reference it when I leave. So Jesus did an interesting thing. Some people came to him probably with the newspaper headlines of the day and referenced there these Galileans who were killed. The way the historians talk about it is that they're not certain what incident they were referring to. But in fact, there was a time wrong this time of Jesus when Pilate planned to build an aqueduct, he was going to give Jerusalem a better water supply. And he was going to give Jerusalem this water supply. It was a good plan. Good civil infrastructure he was going to have built there. And so, and so he said he was going to raise money to do this by taking money from the temple treasury. And the Jews got real upset and they started a protest. And Pilate ordered the soldiers to disguise themselves with regular garb covered over their soldiers' uniforms. And he told them, mix with them in the protest. And when a certain signal would be given, when a certain signal would be given, I want you to start attacking the regular people, and they did. And the soldiers did a brutal thing on these people. Brutal attack. And many of them were killed. The records suggest that it was a real brutal incident. So, so apparently it hit the newspapers, putting it in our parlance of the day, and, and they came to Jesus and said, look what happened, look what happened. And Jesus said, wait, you think these people who got massacred by Pilate's soldiers were more sinners than anybody else? Or do you think those people, he spoke about this, this incident and then he spoke about another disaster where the tower at Siloam fell and 18 people were killed. Luke records the story there. And he said, you think those people were, were sinners than anybody else? I often wonder about Jesus. Jesus speaks in a current event and he looked to the current event to make a moral point. He looked 
at the current event to teach a spiritual lesson. So he looked at a human inflicted horror, massacre, and he looked at something which happened there, a, 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 a tragedy, an accident, and he pulled from both to make one point. Uh, he was going to make a moral point. He said, do you think these people who died thusly were more sinners than anybody else? I wondered about that. Why does he use such incidents to introduce this parable that he was going to introduce according to Luke's record? I only reflected just a little bit about this. I don't know that I came up with anything sumptuous about why Jesus used current events, except it seems to me as if Jesus wanted us also to be tuned in to the current affairs of our day. I think that's probably what he wanted. That's one point he wanted to make there. And sometimes we might be carried away into thinking that that didn't happen to me because I am better than somebody else. We can get to that place. Jesus is simply saying, here, maybe you shouldn't be so fast to conclude such a conclusion. It's just an aside observation he's making as he moved along to whatever he wanted to talk about. I look around the world these days and sometimes I am wondering. It is easy for us to think uh, that, and, and by the way, Jesus' point here, moving along, seemed to be that you have to be careful that you don't look at individual tragedy and accuse people of anything about their own lives. That's what he was saying. Don't look at individual tragedy and accuse people of anything about their own lives. I think that as we look around our society, as we look around the world, there is a phrase that comes to my mind constantly when I look at this. And it's about Jesus' comment about the end time when the Son of Man comes back to this earth. What is he going to find, to paraphrase it? Would he find faith? We live in a time when, when the evil of humanity has become so, so distasteful to observe. So distasteful. Introductorily, I just can linger on this a little bit. And here is how I phrase this. Here is how I understand this. Here is what I'm seeing around our society. As time goes on, I think Jesus is observing the collective evil of humanity would become so intense that we would look with chagrin, with disgust as what, at what we see happening around us. That's just the progressive evil, the progressive multiplication of the evil of humanity towards humanity. We thought we were done with that. When did we have dogs and 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 tear gas being thrown at people in a, in a peaceful protest. We thought we had voted that thing out of our society already. No. No. We have not. And so we see a young man running for his life from a police officer. And he's shot. He's hit. I read the thing in detail and I'm reporting what I read in the papers. Jesus brought the thing, brought the thing to Jesus. I'm bringing to you what, what I got from the, what I read. He's running, and he shot him, and he hit him, and he spun around with his hands in the air, and he opened fire, and in eight, five, eight shots fired. What evil has happened to us? You think that's about, just on here in Los Angeles on Sunday morning, Saturday, Sunday morning here, a man was shot by a police officer in handcuffs. Our society, our society, we look at this evil. We look at this evil. Last week I referenced the fact that people are coming into the country from, 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 brut from situations of brutality. I don't care why they come. These are little kids. Children. And people, I was trying to clear my schedule so that I could go up to Menifee to join the other side to say, no, we are better people than this. I couldn't clear my schedule to get there. But people did take that alternative view. But people got up there to protest. Why are you bringing Marietta? Why are you bringing these people to our community? 
This is our society. This is our society. Our evil has gotten really, really distasteful. And we can just scan our cameras, our, our proverbial mental cameras around the world. Just look around the world. And I can pick any place and you wonder what can happen to people when the group think becomes so intense in our Sabbath school lesson our Sabbath school teacher reference ISIS what can make people think that it's okay for us to force a community out of their homes and behead their people what can make us get to that place and by the way let's be clear they didn't only do that to Christians they didn't just chase Christians out. I'm making this point because I think it's consistent with Jesus' point. The evil will know no sect. It will know no religion. It will have respect for no one. It will attack everybody. That's the pl place our world is getting to. So when the Son of Man comes, what is he going to find? It's evil. And so I think that's Jesus' point to us. Don't you ever think that you are better than anybody else. Don't you ever think that. Because the evil that we see reaching around the planet may well get to us. And I read one, one place where one author said, Sometimes nations make their choices. And when nations make their choices, those nations sometimes reap the benefits or the consequences of those choices. I think that's what the Proverbs, the wise man meant when he said, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I think that's what he was referring to. How nations can collectively make decisions that can come to be a blessing or can come to be a curse. So Jesus told that introductory story. Jesus is addressing the reality of evil on the world, in the world. And then Jesus moves from that. As they came to him, I am just thinking, somebody, they, Luke said, they raised this thing with him because he's talking about these, these incidents. You know, as you close out there in, in Luke chapter 12, he's talking about these things. And now they come to him and said, they came to him and said, Lord, what about this? And Jesus said, don't think that you're exempt. And so why is this exemption there? He now proceeds to talk a parable to them. He parabled unto them a parable. He said a man had, he said a man had a vineyard. And in this vineyard, he had a fig tree. Fig tree. Fig trees were popular in vineyards in Jesus' day. Fig tree. The fig tree was used by the Jews as a representation of the Jewish nation. Fig trees. As a matter of fact, when you read in the Old Testament, you will see there were times when Israel was reported to be the planting of the Lord that God might be glorified in Isaiah 61 and verse 3. That's what is referenced there. So the fig tree, Jesus said, this man planted this fig tree and in the parable, the fig tree was planted in the vineyard and he came looking for fruit. Fruit. So my first observation here today of the things I want to say, my first observation is, okay, let's think of this backdrop of evil in the planet, on the planet and the evil of humanity towards humanity. In the midst of that and in the midst of that illustration, Jesus said, this guy had this fig tree, the fig tree, first of all, I'm observing, the fig tree occupied a special privileged position. It represented the nation of Israel which occupied a special privileged position. And for this privileged position came that sacred responsibility, the fig tree. Representing the nation of Israel, it occupied a privileged position. And with the privileged position came 
the sacred responsibility. What is the responsibility? The guy, the owner of this vineyard, he had a vine dresser there. The old word was the husbandman. The, that's the word they use, the person, the gardener, the person who took care of the vineyard. So he comes to the man, he said, you know, you know, I've, I've, I came here three consecutive years. Three consecutive years, year after year after year, I came here. Why did he come? Come. Why did he come according to verse 6? Come on, talk back to me, somebody. What, what did he come looking for? He came looking for fruits. That's right, for figs. That's what he came for. That's what he came for. He planted and he came looking for fruits. The fig tree, remember I said, represents this nation. A privileged position. Planted by God. That's the understanding. Israel was a nation planted by God. Privileged position. And with that came a certain sacred responsibility. You have to produce fruit. At prayer meeting, um, we were talking there on Wednesday night. And one of our saints was talking about planting in the garden and had so much more than, than, than she could consume. Plenty. Brother Pancho, I notice also plants. Don't have anything to do. He's always planting something. Plenty things. Well, I, I don't really mean it that way. I don't have anything to do. I am lazy about the planting stuff, so my wife doesn't get me too much engaged in that. But this planting, they have a lot. They didn't go out planting with no expectation. That is my point. Nobody plants a tree and doesn't expect something from its sister. Amity is not here today. I know Brother Keith doesn't like the garden too much, but she does a lot of gardening. She also has fruits they bring and they give away. Hey, come on, somebody say amen. We appreciate, we appreciate the gifts of the saints when they give us the fruits of their labors. Nobody goes out planting without a purpose. The garden... The tree, the fig tree, must produce fruits. I think, and I read the servant of the Lord on this. I read many commentators. The, the, the tree represents in our day and time the Christian church. And if it represents the Christian church, maybe it represents me in the church. So each of us, in my opinion, and we referenced this a few weeks ago when Jesus said, all that I have are yours. I only have who you gave to me. Every person in the Christian church has been planted by God. And God plants nobody just to look at us year after year after year. And we are not Bearing fruit. Am I making any sense? What fruits? You asked me what fruits? We were placed in this favorable position. Like a church member, we were placed in a vineyard. Not on some neglected wasteland. Planted in the garden by God, the owner of the vineyard. Brought out of the world into the church. Beneficiaries of special promises. Upon us, the blessings and graces of the Holy Spirit are freely imparted. We are objects of divine care. So the owner of the land and the provider of the care, the benefits expects that is the owner of the land expects something he expects fruits what fruits what fruits you may ask i might suggest the fruits of the spirit according to galatians chapter 5 love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness kindness faithfulness self-control what fruits 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they might, glory, might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The fruits may well be the good works. What fruits? Matthew 7 and verse 16 reference the fruits of obedience. You will know them by their fruits. The fruits. And so the, the point here is, there is expectation that people planted by God in this place of privilege are expected to produce fruits. Are we together on this? Maybe I should ask, are we agreed on this? Christ subject lesson speech 215. God in his son had been seeking fruit and had found none. Israel was a cumberer of the ground. Its very existence was a course, for it filled the place in the vineyard that a fruitful tree might have filled. It robbed the world of the blessings that God designed to give. The Israelite had misrepresented God among the nations. They were not merely useless but a decided hindrance. To a great degree, their religion was misleading and wrought ruin instead of salvation. That's Ellen White Christ's Object Lessons, page 215, the nation. I couldn't help but struggle with that a little bit as I looked into this passage here that I struggled with what she is saying there. He said, he spoke a parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. This is a, the man there in the parable represents God. The vineyard, the fig tree represented the nation of Israel. This is a blessed place. It was not just on any wasteland. And he came seeking fruit. This special privileged position had a sacred responsibility. That's what I'm seeing. And if this sacred position, this response, this, this, this privileged position had a sacred responsibility, the owner of the vineyard came and found nothing. And the servant of the Lord is saying that not only did they not produce, they had encumbered the soil. You know, in the Middle East, this, this area of Palestine, land was scarce. Land was scarce. And so everything that somebody planted, they expected it to be productive. And it was customary for them to cut down the tree if the tree was not producing. Two years, the fig tree was expected to start producing, to start bearing fruits. This guy, this three year is not from the time it was planted. It's from the time the owner of the vineyard started coming and looking for fruit. He found nothing. And so that brings me to the second observation of the day. Uselessness, it seems to me. This probably is suggesting to us that uselessness invites disaster. Uselessness invites disaster. That which is useful grows from strength to strength. And that which is useless will be eliminated. And so he said, cut it down. Cut it down. Judgment comes upon this nation as a result of this non-productivity. Uselessness invites disaster. He said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit in this tree and find none. Cut it down. Cut it down. I read and I looked at this 
and it seems as if there is something significant happening there. The word literally means, the Greek word cut it down, literally means cut it out. Excise it from the garden. In addition to bearing no fruit, it takes up the ground and makes the ground idle. It is of no use. Take it out and throw it away. Root and branch. Cut it out. That's how the parable speaks. Is this a story about Israel? Well, this Bible was written for the church of Jesus' day, and it was written for the church thereafter. This Bible, this thing is not for people who do not know the Lord. This is for us. That's what my sense is. So Jesus Christ is saying to us, I'm sensing here that this, this uselessness is inviting disaster. That which is useful grows. And so let's stay on the positive. Every now and then I encounter people who like to do physical exercise. They run to the gym and they do a lot of exercising. Sometimes I wish that they can just have a garden and go there and work in the garden and they'll get exercise, you know. But where I grew up, people didn't need to go to the gym. The kind of work they did was hard work. It was hard work. Why you think I decided I'm not going to live there? Just too much hard work. I just, and, I, and I remember just the other day I was reflecting on this with some of the guys who grew up there. I remember some of these guys, they were taut. Muscles were tight. They didn't, they didn't go to the gym. It's the kind of work they did. They were throwing sledgehammers and they used chainsaws and they were out in the heat of the day. They were working with timber and all. They were just, they were just muscular people. It occurred to me that my muscles would never be like their muscles. Never. Too lazy. Physical exercise, I'm not involved in that to that degree. The muscle that gains strength is the muscle that is working. Am I making any sense? The muscle that gains strength is the muscle that is at work. The muscle that is not at work gets flabby. It gets weak and flaccid. It is not healthy. Uselessness invites disaster. I read a story once of a guy who fell down under the influence of alcohol, he was so drunk, he, he, he was passed out there and his, his limb was in an awkward position where the circulation could not get through. And by the, time they, by the time they found him there a few days afterward, that limb, the medical people can give the more accurate explanation of what happened. But that lack of circulation was so severe that they had to amputate that limb. The lack of circulation. So it's something here that is important to us. The church, the church member. Uselessness invites disaster. Usefulness is what we were made for. The work of God indicates the building of strength for God and that labor of love is important for us to be attentive to. Judgment came based on the opportunities that Israel has had. C.E.M. Jode once said, we have the power of gods and we use them like irresponsible schoolboys. Never was a generation entrusted with such great, entrusted with so much, and never was a generation so responsible or answerable to God, he said. So we have a responsibility 
we have responsibility. And so he said here now, cut it out. Usefulness invites disaster. That which is useful grows from strength to strength. And that which is useless will be eliminated. Then he said this problem. He said to the gardener, see now, see, see. Three years I've come looking for something. The fig tree was there. For three years from the time of the last visit. And the time it was planted. One of the most searching questions that any of us could be asked is. Of what purpose? Are you in the church, Horatius? Nothing which only takes can really ever survive. And so it's important for us to understand. I read through the Bible sometimes. And this week I did a little excursion in that kind of exercise. And I ask myself sometimes, every now and then, why did God give such and such a person such and such a gift? So, for example, we can pull Abraham. And, and, and you don't have to take a whole lot to see why God blessed him in such tremendous ways. So much so that he is called the father of the faithful. Every place you notice him, the folks said as he traveled from spot to spot, people came to where he, where he passed and they knew he passed there because they can see the altars that he set up. They know this was a man of God and it's a set of him that he commanded his household after him. That's what we see. We can see distinctly the benefit of the blessing. I read that and then I came across a guy like Lot. Receive blessings. What was the purpose of the blessing? I'm not questioning God. That's not what it is. I'm just doing a human reflection. Well, what did he do? What did he produce? He just wanted to be close to Sodom. God had to hurry. The angel had to hurry him out to deliver him. Because he wanted to be so close to Sodom. I look at David. And I see great blessings. Sometimes people get upset with David. They talk, well, God didn't want him to build the temple and all that kind of thing. Nice, great criticisms. The temple was destroyed. We still have the Psalms. The blessing that he produced as a result of God. The guy just before him, the king just before him, Saul. God gave him a blessing, gave him a gift, gave him physical stature and handsomeness. Gave him the Holy Spirit, he prophesied. What do we have? What do we have from Saul, the king? I heard a guy, I, I don't know, sometime this week I read something where somebody said, if even David's father, David looked, David's father looked wrong, just looked wrong. The, the, the Samuel came, he said, you got a son, I got an anoint to be king. He pulled the handsome one and he went through all of them. Jesse, in his mind, there is one child that I have who is not good for king. It's David. So it's everybody? He said, he said, well, I got another one out there. He is, he's looking after the sheep. He's always behind the sheep. He, you know, he's, he likes to tumble out there in the rolling hills. He said, go bring him. He makes a little talk. Samuel said, listen, listen. Man, look on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. My only point here is that we can go to the Bible and we can see the blessings of God. God bless people with and you can see the benefits to the world, to the church. And so Jesus had 12 around him. 12 of them, they were just riffraff. They were just, just, just rugged guys. And, and you see and they got the gift of the spirit they went out there and they cast out demons Judas was amongst them what was the benefit to the church of the blessing uselessness invites disaster the person in service for God 
grows from strength to strength. And I want when the question is asked of me, Horatius, of what benefit were you to the church, I want to have an answer that would please God. And so there is a habit that this tree had. It was a habit of only taking. So I said first of all here, very simple, I said first of all here, the fig tree occupied a special privileged position. It represents the nation of Israel. And for this privileged position comes a sacred responsibility. The same is to be said of us. Uselessness invites disaster. That which is useful grows from strength to strength. And that which is useless will be eliminated. And so this habit of only taking is a threat to survival. The habit, my third observation, the habit of this fig tree of only taking was a threat to its own survival. We all are in debt to life. The life of somebody. Life by definition means productivity. And so if we think about this a little bit, if we think about this a little bit, we all came into the world at the peril of someone else's life. When people get pregnant, literally, their lives assume a certain risk to bring a newborn into the world, literally. I could have known someone who died in child's birth. Her life was placed at risk, so risky. She had a first child, a second child, and a third child with a third child in child's birth. The risk as a result of being used to bring a new life into the world. My observation is a simple observation that we ought to be grateful. We ought to be grateful. We ought to life the responsibility to find a way to make a contribution. The life of every Christian born in the church is at the risk of somebody else's life. Jesus gave his life so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. And so, and so, and so, and so, this whole habit of only taking is a threat to our survival. We are in debt to the life of Jesus Christ. Abraham Lincoln once said, die when I may. I want it to be said of me. I plucked a weed and planted a flower wherever I thought a flower should grow. So this is what we have. And so the, 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 the owner of the garden said this, oh, cut it down, cut it down. He said, the gardener said, give it another year. Give it another year. The gardener said, give it another year. The gardener said, let me dig around it. The word literally means there in the, um, in the Old King James Version, he said, let me dung it. He, was gonna, he said, let me put some more manure around it. The word the New Revised Standard Version uses manure. Let's put some more manure around it. Let me dig around it. He's going back to the old agricultural strategy. He's digging around it and he's putting the manure there. He said, give it another year. Give it another year. Please, give it another year. And this brings me to the fourth observation of the day. God, the God we serve, is a God of second chances. Is a God of second chances. God is a God who gives chance after chance 
after chance. He is a God of second chances. The gospel is a gospel of second chances. With God, a new day is another day for a new opportunity. Give it another year. Give it another round of seasons. Give it another series of rains and sunshines. Give it another winter. Give it another spring. Give it another summer. Give it another fall. I will just go ahead and keep on manuring it. I will make its life one of increased blessings. Give it another year. And I'll support it. I bet you it's going to produce. And so the parable shows the marvelous patience of God. The fig tree had its time. It was time for it to be cut down. But another chance was given to the nation of Israel. Jesus himself came. And he showed them how the life should be lived. John, Mark, Peter, Paul, David... All of them recognize the gospel is a gospel of second chances. Every one of them knew that God was willing to give another chance. It's the gospel of second chances. Our God does not give up on us just like that. Doesn't do that. It's the beauty of the gospel. We were talking, I don't know, in our little something last night about how we look at people. There's certain people, yeah, yeah, I just remember what it was. We're talking about how, how sometimes we, we, we were actually talking about the enemy. Who is supposed to be the enemy? Who is supposed to be the least amongst us? That's what we were talking in our little Sabbath school lesson review. Who are these people? And we actually came up with certain identifiers how people might label some people. This guy is, and then this person is not fit for the, to be, to be, respected and accepted into the community of saints that's how sometimes people reason jesus is a jesus of second chances peter got out there and he was ready to fight to deliver him and 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 when he was there in the in the room the night when the lady said, I know you the third time. She said, I know you. You are one of them. You are speaking like one of these Galileans. Your speech is a little more dignified. He turned around and he changed his whole demeanor. His language got more consistent with what it used to be. And as he is doing this, he turned around and he saw somebody slap Jesus. And he looked at the pain in Jesus' face. Jesus never felt the slap. But he saw Peter, he said, you remember I told you before the cock crew twice, you will deny three times that you knew me. And he heard the trumpet of the board of the morning, and he ran out from that space, and he went back to Gethsemane, and he knelt there and he prayed the way he saw Jesus pray. This is a God of second chances. And David can tell you the same thing. When he had done his foolishness and he was there enjoying his life in his palace, the prophet came and he called in and made an appointment. He said, I need to talk to you. And he had this great respect for the prophets and so the prophet came in and the prophet told him the parable. He said, who is that man? Bring him before me so that just meant Judgment could be meted out upon him. And the prophet looked at him in the eye and said, You are the man. He took off his garment and in sackcloth and ashes, he begged God for forgiveness. This is a God of second chances. God didn't leave him alone. He said, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. The second chance God gave him a second and a third and a fourth. Whatever the number of chances we want, God gives it to us. God never stops giving us chances. That's the God we serve. How often the servant of the Lord said, has the tender gospel messages trilled your heart? 
You have taken the name of Christ. You are outwardly a member of the church, which is his body. And yet you are conscious of no living connection with the great heart of love. The tide of his life does not flow through you. The sweet grace of his character, the fruits of the spirit, are not seen in your life. The barren tree receives the rain and the sunshine. And the gardener's care. It draws nourishment from the soil, but its unproductive bows only darken the ground so that fruit bearing plants cannot flourish in its shadow. So, God's gifts, lavished on you, convey no blessings to the world. You're robbing others of the privileges that, but for you, might be theirs. Christ Subjects Lessons 216, pages 216 and 270. Oh God, deliver us from our own selves and grant us that opportunity to accept your second chances. The gospel in this story is a gospel of second chances. God gives us a new day and every new day is a day for another opportunity he gives us as many opportunities as we need as many chances as we need so the story comes to an end he said give it another year but he answered and said to him sir let it alone this year also i dig around it and i may fertilize it and if it bears fruit, well, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. One more year. One more year. Another year, Lord, please, another year. And so the gospel indicates, this parable indicates finally, that there is a final chance. Yesterday, could have been my final day. Yesterday could have been my final chance. This parable indicates that there comes a final chance for everybody. Now work with me here, please. The parable makes it clear that there is a final chance. After God gives chance, after chance, after chance, there comes the final chance. But work with me, please. The final chance is not God's decision as much as it is man's decision. The final chance comes when we, by deliberate choice, have shut ourselves out from God. It is not God who shuts us out, but it is the person who, by deliberate choice, chooses to shut himself, herself out from God. And I pray that God delivers every one of us or any one of us, whoever finds ourselves, go into that place. I pray God delivers us from that final chance. In other words, I want God to have us at a place where we consistently enjoy the chance since that God wants us to have. This, this part of the thing here con connects, well, I think, with what we discussed when Jesus said there in John, all that I have are yours. And I spent some time reflecting on that. I, I promised them that I'll talk a little bit about it. There is, there is no record in the Bible of anybody who wanted to be saved who was lost. There is none. The Bible has a thread, a biblical teaching that is systematically thought. Whoever comes to him asking for salvation receives it. The Bible has the thread. Whoever slips and falls and asks God to pick him or her up again is picked up. Nobody is ever left behind by God. So there was a day when Judas got up and walked out of that 
judgment hall. And when he walked out, the Bible said there in Acts, he, he left. And in Acts, we are told he went out and he hung himself. He hung himself. He walked away from Jesus. He walked away from Jesus. That's what he did. If after he betrayed him, he wanted the deliverance, he would have received the deliverance, but he didn't want it anymore. David's sin, in my opinion, as a human onlooker, that's more devious than what Saul did. But Saul never wanted to come back to God. He started walking and he walked and he walked until one day he got to the place where he went to the witch. He was going to talk to the devil instead of going to God and ask forgiveness. He, he went to the devil to seek the devil's intervention in his life. Here is a man who can be said of him as was said of Ephraim. Ephraim is joined to idols. It can be said of Saul. He's joined to the devil. Leave him alone. That's his choice. That's his choice. And so there is a final chance. How do we get to the final chance? We get to the final chance by continuing any direction that we know is against the will of God. That's how we get to the final chance. And the Bible teaches, Jesus said, well, you have to be careful about this thing here. Now you're now calling the work of the Spirit. You're, attrib you're attributing that to the devil. And so all man of blasphemy said shall be forgiven among men. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that's when you feel the work of the Holy Ghost in you. And you resist it to the place now. You are saying this is of the devil. I don't want to hear it. That's a dangerous place to be. That means it culminates in a final irrevocable decision. The person makes that decision. I'm going to forget about God and I'm going to follow after the enemy. Nobody in God's church just asking God to forgive and to guide ever is at that place. You get there when you decide you want to be there. And praise God, glory to God, none of us is there. God is a God of second chances. But the gospel also teaches that he's a God of final chance, which is opened up because of what we do. And so the church, the church is like the fig tree. The church member is like the fig tree. Each of us occupies a special privileged position. And for the privileged position comes a sacred responsibility. What is my attentiveness to that sacred responsibility uselessness invites disaster that which is useful grows from strength to strength and that which is useless will be eliminated the habit of only taking is a threat to survival we all are in debt to Christ we're in debt to Christ's life we gain salvation from Christ and Christ alone. He sacrificed so that we can have. And no matter what, we, what is happening in us, no matter what we may have done, no matter where we are, God is a God of second chances. And the God of second chances reminds us that we can lead ourselves to the place of the final chance. And so the parable tells the story. He said, give it another year. The parable never concludes. It leaves the, 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 the final point blank. We like to talk about the application of the parable. The application is for us to fill in the blanks. And I hasten to say, it's for me to fill in the blanks by my own response to God's call. That's how this parable concludes. It's different from the other parables in that sense. And so, and so, remember those Galileans? You remember those people in Jerusalem who were killed by the Tower of Siloam? You remember all these people and the mountainside in 
Iraq, our Sabbath school superintendent made reference to that this morning. Remember all these people? The people on the battlefields in Syria. The people killing each other in the Eastern African Republic. The, remember the people there in South Sudan? They're just brutalizing each other. You remember these people? You remember the people crossing the border? They're struggling to get something to eat, to get to a warm place. You remember the people who do not want to give health insurance to others who can't afford it necessarily? You remember all those people? You remember the people who preach as if they hate Christians and they say as if they hate God? You remember all those people? All those people who may perish where they are, every Christian who does not repent will perish like them. No difference. The repentance that brings us to God so that we can accept Jesus, that's what makes the difference. Fill in the blanks. O oh God of heaven, O oh God of heaven, we place our hands in yours. Because we need your leadership. We need your leadership, your guidance, your protection every day. You want to guide us in your own sweet way. We want you to teach us the things we ought to do. That's the kind of God we believe we have. And so today we know that just you having you as our father places us in a privileged position. And so God help us, help us to with that privilege accept the sacred responsibility. Now God, we do not want to be useful. We want you to look over us, oh God, and make us useful we don't want to be useless we want you to make us useful people when our work seems hard and dry help us to press on cheerily that's the kind of people we want you to make us make us productive oh god help us to understand that just taking is not a good sign because we owe our lives to the life that Jesus sacrificed for us. And today, and today, oh God, we know that you are a God of second chances. And help that our final chance will take us safely to glory with you. Where we can live and reign with you forever. Give us another year. Make us productive. We pray and we thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.